I wouldn't mind just having a little bit of a chat for those who aren't familiar as, <laughs> as familiar as you are with climate stuff about what a La Nina is. And there's the flip of the El Nino, uh, La Nina, of course, is the El Nino. So would you yes. like to just talk about those two weather patterns and what they all mean? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, you're, you're quite right. Um, La Nina is obviously translated from the Spanish means the girl child. And El Nino from Spanish is the boy child, and they are literally the yin, yin and yang. They are the opposites of each other. Most Australians have heard of El Nino because they know what it means for us. It means drought, uh, bushfires, heat waves, low rainfall, weaker monsoon, less cyclones, all those sorts of things. And we probably do get more El Ninos than we do La Ninas, and that's just the way the, the way things work with the Pacific Ocean. So when we have a La Nina, we are literally flipping it the other way. So the, the, we're in a much higher chance of having widespread rainfall over most of the east, the north and the south, but much less so in the west. The west tends to get lower rainfall in La Ninas and more rainfall during El Ninos because it's more influenced by the Indian Ocean. So, yeah, we, this is quite useful because it's telling us that we've got this anomaly in the tropical equatorial Pacific where we've got cool cool water sort of uh, if you like east of the date line right towards the coast of south america and all that upwelling of cold water uh, leads to high pressure so you get high pressure developing in the atmosphere driven by that very cold water great for the anchovy fishermen because all that upwelling and the guano birds they rely on that upwelling of nutrients for their food chain so they get quite excited but on our side of the pacific which is the western pacific we, we've got these um, areas of relatively warmer water, which is in the equatorial Pacific across northern Australia and also out into the Coral Sea. And that literally, uh, I don't know whether this is too detailed, but that leads to generally low pressure. And of course, low pressure means rising clouds, high, high cloudiness, higher rainfall. And you've got the high pressure in the east and the low pressure in the west, and that leads to a strong pressure gradient. So we get stronger trades during a La Nina. And that those stronger trades bring the moisture in off the Pacific Ocean. It dumps itself as rain over Australia, and it's particularly enhanced in the wet tropics because of the mountain ranges uh, along the coast. And we can get really big rain events during during um, La Niña's in the wet tropics. And we're talking big events, and these these historically have been documented, uh, including 1974. Uh, which was a very, very wet year indeed. So so basically with, with the La Nina, we've got, with an El Nino, it's the opposite way around. So with the, with a El Nino, we've got uh, warm water off the coast of South America, cuts off the upwelling, and we've got relatively colder water over towards the Western Pacific, which dampens any, any chances of rainfall or reduces the amount of rainfall. So they are, they are the opposites of each other. I guess should point out that they are both extremes. Most of the time, 70% of the time, the Pacific Ocean is in what's called a neutral phase. It's neither La Nina nor El Nino. Uh, so it's sitting in the middle, and that's our average kind of year. So we do know these, these events don't occur every year. We know they're every three to seven years, but we know that the last La Nina to affect Australia was 2010, 2011. Now, people won't forget 2011 February, people in far north Queensland, because we had Cyclone Yasi, uh, a very severe cyclone, which obviously is had a big impact on our waterways, particularly mm. southern parts, sort of south of Cairns, th those sort of catchment areas and offshore areas. And, of course, we had the floods as well, but the floods were probably more, more a problem in Lockyer Valley, Brisbane River, Rockhampton, the Fitzroy. Um, yep. But it's interesting, it was, the, it was the floods from the Fitzroy River that led to the impacts in Glaston Harbour that led to the first report card being set up by the Office of the Great Barrier Reef. Yeah, well, certainly the first regional report card. There was one operating, of course, in southeast Queensland for quite a long time before that. You mentioned that 2010-2011 was a La Nina year and we had Cyclone Yasi, which was a fairly extreme cyclone. But my understanding is that in a, a La, Nina, La Nina year, we might get more cyclones, but not necessarily stronger. Is that correct? Yeah, so what, what happens in a La Nina year, because we've got that warm water sitting off the coast, we've got all that rising air and low pressure, mm. uh, we tend to get a stronger monsoon circulation coming down mm. during the summer months. So normally the monsoon kicks in over the territory, usually around Christmas time. For us in the wet, the wet tropics area, normally it's January before we see the, the first sort of monsoon burst. 
Th these monsoon bursts tend to be stronger because the trade winds are stronger. So that brings the monsoon trough down, and that's often a hot spot for lows to form. Naturally, we can't predict exactly where the cyclones will occur and when they will occur. No one can do that. We just know there's a high likelihood. Mm. Yeah, in terms of intensity, it's interesting because Yasi was a very intense cyclone during a La Nina, but we can get intense cyclones in neutral years and also yeah. in Ninos, but we tend to get much less cyclones. They, they tend to be much further east towards the kind of Fiji area during El Nino. La Nina, they tend to be more on our part of the world. So it's something to watch out for, um, mm. obviously, for our catchments, but also for the people living in the catchments to be prepared for what could be a busy uh, cyclone season. Sure. And what are the other uh, sort of weather patterns that we can expect? So cyclones, obviously, they're one thing. They're a major thing. They can have all kinds of I implications, both for, as you say, in our local communities and our environment. You mentioned that 2011 was also a big flood year, uh, not necessarily in the wet tropics, but is that something we might expect here as well? Yeah, there's a higher chance of um, riverine flooding, but also flash flooding mm -hmm. as well. So flash flooding associated with a, an active monsoon trough or possibly a tropical low embedded in it. So we tend to have more of these systems closer to the Queensland coast during La Nina events. Because the trade winds are stronger, they, they're bringing in a lot more moisture on the southern flank of any low uh, below the monsoon trough. So when we do get periods of uh, active monsoonal activity, we're more likely to see periods of heavy rain, not necessarily tropical cyclones, but sometimes we do get them when, when these events occur. So that could lead to much higher um, runoff um, values, but not uh, unlike other years where we tend to have all the wet coming in one kind of big event or two big events, with a La Nina, it could start very early. Uh, I mentioned 1973, uh, which is on that infographic we just had up before, Probably our wettest, um, that was our probably our wettest La Nina, or one of the wettest. You can see how wet it was across the whole country. Virtually the whole continent is blue, um, whereas the 1938 La Nina was quite a dry one, and that's probably because other drivers are coming into play, like the Indian Ocean Dipole, uh, which, by the way, they didn't really know about that in 1938. It's a relatively new uh, system in terms of science. So in 1973, the wet season started very early in the north, in some areas as early as September, and it went right through, of course, into 1974 and culminated in the, the Brisbane floods in particular. So um, but what I'm saying is more prolonged rain, a much longer wet season, a much earlier onset to the monsoon, it might come in early December rather than in early January. So everything is going to be brought mm. forward with a La Nina. Uh, which is good news for many areas that uh, haven't had rain now, for, in some cases, for seven years. I read yesterday 70% mm. of the state of Queensland is drought declared. And, of course, the wet tropics is uh, generally immune to these kinds of things. Uh, but for us, it does mean we need to be prepared for more, particularly big river, event, river flood events uh, this coming summer. Because that's a question on everyone's lips, of course. We've had a, a couple of fairly severe bleaching events over the last few years. What does a La Nina mean for us in terms of the impacts on coral? Well, just, just recapping on the 2016 uh, mass bleaching event, that mainly affected the reefs along the northern, to the north of the wet tropics, but also some of the wet tropics around mm -hmm. Douglas, for example, but particularly off Cape York. That was, of course, an El Nino year. So we do expect a much higher risk of coral bleaching with El Nino. Historically, they've always been in El Ninos. And then 2017 came along and it was a neutral year. So it was one of those average years that I was talking about in terms of the Pacific Oscillation, um, the, sorry, the El Nino Southern Oscillation. And we had a, a mass bleaching event that mainly affected the reefs off our region, the wet tropics region. And that had people shaking their heads because it's the first documented bleaching we've ever had in a neutral year. 2020 came along and snuck in under COVID. We had a mass beaching event mainly in the southern parts of the Great Barrier Reef, so south of our region, particularly down towards the Swain Reefs in the south. Now, that was actually another neutral year. So we've had five coral bleaching events in five years. With the La Nina, the, the risk for coral bleaching is extremely low because we've got increased cloud cover from all that low pressure I was talking about. Uh, and rising air and, and general raininess. 
but also we've got the effect of those stronger trade winds and they will come in and they will mix the surface layers in the GBR lagoon and by mixing the warm water with the cooler water below you you basically negate the risk for coral bleaching. Um, if there is a coral bleaching event during this La Nina then we have to question what's the future for the Great We've Barrier. got real problems yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we also keep in mind corals you know they are a little bit like Goldilocks they don't like it too hot they don't like it too cold they also <laughs> don't like fresh water <laughs> so they don't like freshwater plumes but that's probably more an issue for some of the inshore reefs so sometimes mm. you can get coral bleaching during a very wet year in some of those near shore systems because they just don't like fresh water sitting on them but for the most part our, the gbr should have respite this coming summer and hopefully continue to recover the way that it is at the moment Thinking about our, our freshwater systems and our estuaries as well, you know these these major rain events, these wet wet seasons, extended wet seasons are actually really important to the ecology and they're important for fluvial geomorph processes and a whole range of things. So um, it's really important, you know, that we do get these from time to time. And it's obviously been a little while since we've had one. So um, well, you know, as a fisherman or fisher fisher, that you've got to have these. Uh, scouring you know you need to scour the rivers out at some stage and, and then you get longer term benefits from that uh, I, I couldn't agree more um i guess we, we think about cyclone yasi though where the impact from the storm uh, the wave energy had a big impact on the seagrass beds mm -hmm. so can river floods so river floods that dump a lot of sediment on top of the seagrass can smother it, and it but it you know and it takes a long time to come back now that's probably not as bad as the scouring from a cyclone but nonetheless um you know it's something to keep in mind that it, it may be more of an issue for those larger river systems which are going to take a lot more sediment out to sea uh, like we saw with the mary river quite well quite a few years ago when the seagrass beds were badly impacted in harvey bay and impacted on the dugong population hmm. a long time hmm. to recover so yeah that's something to keep in mind uh the geomorphology of a lot of our systems does depend on big rain events from time to time to scour them out and and to allow them to i guess to re-equilibriate re yep reset everything yeah resetting with the landscape mm -hmm. not just the ecology but also the geomorphology as you said yeah so okay. we'll go through till next winter so it'll give us a good um 12 months and there's about half of La Nina's continue for another year okay. it, it's mainly because all this warm water is sloshed to our side of, of the Pacific it's such a vast ocean it takes a long time for that to slosh its way back across um, into the east so we get that benefit sometimes for a couple of years uh, sometimes mm. up to three years we can get the benefit of a La Nina uh, and that'll hopefully keep our farmers happy out west now, Steve, I know people start predicting, you know, La Nina and El Nino events well in advance, and they're always a little bit, you know, it's a, if you're a betting man, you're probably not going to put too much money on it too far out. But we're getting closer and closer to that time of year where it's going to become sort of locked in, I guess, for want of a better term, and it, it's going to be real. So what do you reckon the odds are of this event happening? I think they're very high. Uh, the reason is that all the indicators are continuing to be pushing in that direction. Um, which includes the sea surface temperatures, but also the Southern Oscillation Index, which, which is quite positive at the moment. When I say positive, I mean as in the sign positive. Uh, and also the Indian Ocean Dipole is playing in our direction as well. So it's not, I think in the 1938 event, which was a, a kind of dry La Nina, uh, it, it wasn't in a, in a phase that suited it. So I think, you know, as I say, the, the ducks are lining up and you may not think it now, it's still very clear skies at the moment. But things will change very quickly once we get into that kind of October, November, we start getting the storm season. We should see an increase in rainfall coming in. So for the wet tropics, it's likely definitely to be very wet. And yeah. with yeah. risk of tropical cyclones. So everybody needs to be prepared for that. Um, and hopefully some of the work that's been happening in the catchments with catchment repair, best management practice, things like trash blanketing of the cane fields, these kinds of things, uh, and interrows between the bananas, grassy interrows, all of these sorts of things that weren't around in 1973, 74, that weren't happening in the landscape. We had terrible loss of soil into the GBR lagoon. Farmers don't want to lose soil. It's their livelihood. 
So we should see hopefully some of those mitigation strategies pl play into fruition this time. Yeah, yeah. Do you get more wet seasons like we did back then in the, in the 1970s. And in report card world, as you said, this will be our first La Nina event since the report card started. So we'll start to see the data for this event coming through in 2022. So not next year's report card, but the one after we've got a little bit of a wait to see what it, how it all pans out. But it's going to be a very interesting assessment to do. Yeah, and I think we can probably, you know, do some, you know, when we do the report card launch next year, we can probably recap a little bit on the um, what's happened over that wet season. And we might have some initial data that we, we can share. Hmm. But certainly, there'll be plenty of photographic evidence in terms of aerial imagery of river plumes and so, and so forth, if this turns out to be the big wet that it's predicted to be. So it, it'll be interesting for us for 2022 report card to report on that back to, to our stakeholders who, who are interested in, in what, you know, what these kinds of events might do to our, to our waterway systems. Absolutely. So there we go. Very interesting. Go yeah. ahead. Well, Steve, that was tremendous. Thank you so much for giving us a bit of an insight into what this La Nina might mean for the wet tropics.